But in this video, we're going to talk about Eugene Ionesco's short play, The Leader. When I say short play, it's about 10 pages long in this version. Um, it is an extremely short play. And to be honest, not all that much really happens, but it's still a weird, interesting little, uh, little show. So we start with three characters on stage, an announcer and two admirers, one male and one female. Um, the opening stage directions say, Standing with his back to the public center stage and with his eyes fixed on the upstage exit, the announcer waits for the arrival of the leader. To the right and left, riveted to the walls, two of the leader's admirers, a man and a girl, also wait for his arrival. So we start with this weird bit that's essentially a kind... Like, we have these three characters who are really, really embedded in a cult of personality for the leader. Basically... So, whenever they're on stage, the two admirers have themselves basically pressed up against the wall, but they're, like, craning their necks to try and see what the leader is doing. Meanwhile, the announcer is basically giving a play-by-play -play of the things that the leader is doing as he processes through this town. Um, and, I mean, a lot of them, a lot of the things make sense in terms of what a leader would do while processing through a town and, like, greeting the people and things like this. Um, but some of them are just bizarre. Some, some of the things that the leader does don't really make that much sense. Like, for instance, um, so at one point, uh, he's signing autographs. So that's pretty straightforward, right? But then the next line, the leader is stroking a hedgehog, a superb hedgehog. The crowd applauds. He's dancing with the hedgehog in his hand. He's embracing his dancer. Hoorah, hoorah, cries are heard in the wings. He's being photographed with his dancer on one hand and the hedgehog on the other. He greets the crowd. He spits a tremendous distance. So, the announcer is announcing all this stuff. The admirers are riveted by what's going on, even though it's this bizarre set of things. Um, and, it, of course, that's very interesting in the context of a post-2016 United States where the right has really given in to a cult of personality very, uh, very dramatically. But this idea that, like, that everything the leader does is of the utmost fascination is very much a fascistic idea, is very much an authoritarian idea. And we see this, again, with the cult of personality repeatedly. Um, so we see this with Mussolini, we saw this with Hitler, we saw this with Stalin, we see this with authoritarian leaders. And you know what? I'll put Donald Trump in that category as well. I mean, so much of Trump's presidency was run not on the question of what are his policies and are they good for the country, but on what is he as a person doing. And that's an incredibly bad sign for a functional society. But anyway, um, this, by the way, this play is not about... Uh, Donald Trump. I don't know when this premiered, but uh, Ionesco Ionesco wrote really in the 60s, 50s, 60s. Um, so that's one set of characters we have, is the, the announcer and the two admirers. The other set of characters we have are the two young lovers. Uh, and they mostly speak in sort of bad romantic drama um, dialogue. So, for instance, we get the stage direction. The young lover enters right and his girlfriend left. They meet center stage. The young lover says, forgive me, madame, or should I say mademoiselle? The girlfriend says, I beg your pardon. I'm afraid I don't happen to know you. Young lover says, and I'm afraid I don't know you either. 
Girlfriend says, then neither of us knows each other. Young lover says, exactly. We have something in common. It means that between us there's a basis of understanding on which we can build the edifice of our future. Girlfriend says, that leaves me cold, I'm afraid. She makes as if to go. Young lover says, oh, my darling, I adore you. Girlfriend says, darling, so do I. They embrace. Young lover says, I'm taking you with me, darling. We'll get married straight away. So their interactions are all just these sort of weird, bizarre... Um, these very standard kinds of lines that you might expect to see in crappy romantic plays or movies or TV shows or whatever it is. So there's not much substance to them. Um, but where it starts to get interesting is actually toward the end of the play. And because it's such a short play, the end really starts kind of in the middle, paradoxically enough. Um, but in the in the the first half to maybe three quarters, first half to two thirds of the play, you have the stage, the occupants of the stage altering between the announcer and the admirers and the two young lovers. They're going back and forth in terms of who's on stage, and then we get this sort of bizarre, almost like comedy style chase sequences where. Uh, the announcer and the admirers are running off on and off to try and see the leader, and the young lover is running away from the girlfriend, and they're playing this stupid, like, oh, you gotta catch me if you wanna kiss me, kind of stupid fucking game. Um, and so we have this idea, this thematic idea introduced about trying to catch something that will give your existence purpose. And that's very much in line with theater of the absurd. And UNESCO is one of the, the sort of key practitioners of theater of the absurd. This idea of seeking to make meaning out of a fundamentally meaningless universe. That is very much an existentialist idea, very much an absurdist idea. And so we can read in these sort of chase scenes where one group is chasing the leader and the other group is chasing love, these attempts to find something that will, will structure and give meaning to their existence. Now, pretty much at the very end, the leader is about to actually show up on stage for the first time. Uh, ha, ha. Um, and what happens... So previously, the admirers, one had been on each wall whenever the leader was in proximity. Now, on the one wall... So, the admirer and the girlfriend flatten themselves against the wall right, the girl admirer and the young lover against the wall left. The two couples are in each other's arms embracing. So we have this, this splitting up of what had been the two kind of couples. Um, and in a way, this, this actually reminds me of Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream, where the two sets of lovers are kind of more or less interchangeable, and they do kind of go back and forth between which, which of the other people they want. So this idea is kind of, it's a comic idea. It has a, it has a comic pedigree that they're just sort of arbitrarily switching partners. Um, but then, the climax of the play we get here, uh, in stage directions. The leader enters from upstage, advances downstage to center, to the footlights, hesitates, makes a step to left, then takes a decision and leaves with great energetic strides by right to the enthusiastic hurrahs of the announcer and the feeble, somewhat astonished hurrahs of the other four. These, in fact, have some reason to be surprised, as the leader is headless, though wearing a hat. This is simple to effect. The actor playing the leader, needing only to wear an overcoat with the collar turned up round his forehead and topped with a hat. The man in an overcoat with a hat without a head is a somewhat surprising apparition, 
and will doubtless produce a certain sensation. After the leader's disappearance, the girl admirer says, but, but the leader hasn't got a head. The announcer says, what's he need a head for when he's got genius? Um, and then the young lover says, that's true. Then to the girlfriend, what's your name? And that, that's the last bit of dialogue. So the headless leader is an interesting, interesting symbol. Um, there's a number of potential ways that we can read this symbol. Um, one of them is that the leader has no actual ideas. He He's not a policy guy. He is not a, a leader in the sense that he can set reasonable goals for this society and determine ways to achieve them. That he is just a sort of contentless symbol. Either in the sense that... Uh, He's simply there. He's just there to give a sense that someone is in charge. Or perhaps in a, a slightly different sense. In that because he doesn't represent any actual ideas or policies or positions, people can impose on him whatever ideas, policies, or positions they want a leader to support. We saw this, for instance, with actually both Donald Trump and Barack Obama. There are a lot of people who invested these leaders with particular ideas and goals and policies that they did not, in fact, ever actually attempt to achieve. And so this is a, actually a very common political mistake. Um, another potential way of reading this headless leader is that the state itself is headless. That is, the leader is a non-leader. And this is related to the idea of not having any actual ideas, but that the leader is somehow a figurehead, but is not really in charge. This is maybe a kind, more of a kind of emperor's new clothes issue, where the leader can occupy the position of being a leader, but it's based largely on fantasy, and it doesn't actually reflect any, any real leadership of society. Another some re relatively related uh, reading is that this is a leader who lacks a logical center. Um, this is a leader who engages in irrational behavior. That is, does things that are largely arbitrary. And I mean, we can we could sort of get that sense from the announcer's uh the announcer's sort of play-by-play -play description of this procession, right? Like the leader petting a hedgehog, the leader changing his shirt, drinking coffee and reading the morning paper. These are not really the kinds of things one one does while processing around the town or whatever it is. So there is that sort of element of this is an irrational figure who's behaving arbitrarily. But I think the other, the other potential interpretation, or the other big one that strikes me at least, is that the re that the leader is a no slash anyone figure or a no slash everyone figure rather. So. There's a long dramatic history, particularly in the medieval period, of using character types or stereotypes. Um, often these are allegorical figures. If we go back to the medieval period, the early Renaissance period, etc., etc., um, you would have values that stand in for behaviors. So plays like Mankind or Every Man or John Redford's Wit and Science. Um, these would have... So like Mankind literally stars a character called Mankind who's supposed to represent this generic person, this generic human being. Um, in Wit and Science, we have characters like Wit, like Science, uh, and they represent these particular values associated with those terms. Um, it, actually, in undergrad, I was in a production of Wit and Science, and I played Tediousness and Shame, which 
is not necessarily uh, the proudest uh, casting <laughs> casting experience I've ever had, but they were pretty good parts. Uh, but we may have that kind of thing here. The leader represents the leader, but because the leader has no head, has no defining characteristics, the leader may may represent a sort of blank cam canvas, a sort of everyman figure, in that the leader, and this is often particularly the case in, again, in, in authoritarian systems, in which the leader is imagined to stand for all of us. The leader embodies the collective hopes, dreams, ideals, etc., etc. Um, and because the leader in Ionesco's play does not have distinct defining features, we may see him as this sort of everyman figure who can stand in for the collective. 